All right, we are live with another episode of The Beat Broadcast. My name is Don Henry. I'm Jesse Schulzeberger. And uh, we're really excited to be back for week number two. And I want to encourage everybody watching to please comment, like, subscribe, all that jazz. Uh, we would love to hear from you and uh, want this to be as interactive as we can. So. If you have any questions, uh, please hit us up in the comments section. We'll try to get to them during the show. Um, so yeah, just um, let me see. Um, well, why don't we start out with uh, just a, a bit of a memorial, I guess. Um, well, no, well, we'll get to that later in the show. Um, but. Um, we're going to start out this week, I guess, with Jesse um, and I talking about Corona, basically, and how Corona, uh, coronavirus and the pandemic has affected our playing, our careers, and kind of like what we're looking at going forward for the music industry, for drummers. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's sort of been the genesis of this show. It's a little bit of the, you know, how we started doing this, uh, but we didn't get into it too much last week, but... Uh, we had a we had a request from one of our viewers to kind of cover that topic a in a little bit more depth. So, uh, yeah, just wanted to get into that. So, Jesse, you want to talk a little bit about, you know, what's been going on for you post, you know, pandemic and or during the pandemic and what you're right. looking forward to? Yeah, well, um, you know, I think the I think the comment was kind of how has Corona affected us? Um, as musicians, I mean, I think it's affected all of us in the music industry. Uh, basically, work has stopped as far as being performers, uh, short of going online and doing this type of thing. The uh, as on the teaching end of things, uh, of course, you know, um, lessons have moved over to digital platforms, uh, Zoom right. and Skype and FaceTime and and what whatever we can do to kind of get it done and and keep students engaged and and people learning so i think that's been a really interesting uh thing that's happened with all of this is um i think people were a little reluctant before to even consider taking lessons i i never even gave lessons online until the middle of march and um you know i i is I'd always taken and given lessons in person and I, and it kind of really changed the whole, uh, teacher student dynamic. Right. And, so uh, exactly like what, what, what do you mean by that? Well, I, I think it's changed the way lessons go. You, you know, right. using this sort of a platform, it's, it's virtually impossible to jam with your student, uh, you know, real time. Right. So there's a lot of this is going to be showing things to students and then students playing back. Um, you can't just reach over and correct somebody's grip or, or, you know, right, you know, right. you know, sometimes the camera doesn't quite get that across. You know, I've so many times I've just held my grip or something up to the camera, let my students really see what's, what's going on in my hands. So I think that's, I think that is maybe a drawback from it. I think something that's cool is, you know, students they're sitting at home they're you're you know potentially bored and uh at least we can continue learning and everything yeah. now me uh being a you know drummer and kind of always trying to learn new concepts i've spent a lot of time because like some of my drum heroes are out there doing master classes online i'm watching that i'm, I'm spending a little more time maybe cruising around on YouTube watching tutorials, trying to pick up some new stuff, sharpening my own tools here at home. So when we go back out to perform again, we're better off. You know, we want to come kind of come out swinging uh, on the other end. Yeah. So that, that has definitely been a, you know, something that's happened since the Corona. Yeah. You know, I, I was, uh, I was, Noticing recently a kind of a, a bunch of people posting articles of like, oh, the music industry might never recover. Or live events might be done until 2021 or 2020. You know, it, it seems like there's a lot of doom and gloom. And I think I want to kind of offer a little bit of a counter narrative to that. And because I don't I don't think that, you know, obviously this is 
a very serious situation and it should be taken seriously and so on. But, you know, just this idea that like uh, everything is fundamentally different and fundamentally changed now, I, th I think is maybe, maybe overreacting a little bit, you know? Um, it's not, you know, it's not like zombie apocalypse out there, <laughs> you know? It's, it's serious, but it's, it's not, you know, I don't think this is something where we need to just like fundamentally reevaluate like everything about our entire, you know, careers and, and the music industry as a whole. And I just, I just, you know, I've seen a lot of articles and it's, it's sort of like, this is how it's going to be, you know, different, but not offering a whole lot of like constructive advice on, you know, how can musicians start making money right now? Like how can artists start making money in, in this digital age? And, and the reality is some of this stuff is not going to come back, you know, um, and it's not going to, it's and, and live events are not going to come back until there's some kind of, you know, happy medium of consensus between the government and society about, you know, how safe is it? How much risk are we taking by going out and, you know, going right. to these events and, you know, surrounding ourselves with a bunch of sweaty people, you know, and, and because this is how we grew up. I mean, at least people who love shows and going out, to, you know, clubs, shows, whatever, you know, I mean, we are a social species. And I think it's, it's, you know, when I hear this talk of like, oh, you're never going to, you know, we should never shake hands again. And, you know, we shouldn't, do, it's just, it's, I don't know. I don't, I don't want to be reactive, but it just, it kind of rubs me a little bit, a little bit wrong, you know, because I just feel like that's such a, an essential part of human nature is, is contact with each other and social contact. And I really don't yeah. want to see that go away. And, you know, I, I, I want to see constructive answers to these questions rather than this sort of like, frankly, it, a little bit self-indulgent kind of doom and gloom, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit like, oh, you know, everything sucks, everything's so bad. And, it, you know, I'm, I'm, I think we're really trying to focus on the positive. And, you know, I, one thing is, hey, maybe there's some lessons you can do online and some that, you know, maybe it saves you from driving all over the county to, you know, to, to you know, save some gas, saves the environment sure. a little bit. You know, yeah, you can't reproduce, you know, physical sort of tutelage of the drums, um, you know, very easily. Um, and I certainly wouldn't, you know, I, I don't think I would ever want to replace what I learned from my drum teacher physically while he was able there. He'd be like, no, no, you know, your wrist should move like this or, your, you know, your feet should move like that. There is there is a undeniable physical element to it. But I also think there's, you know, there's some real advantages to you being able to, like, do this from, you know, from your from your studio and heck yeah you know, so. it's it's great and you know one thing is uh, i'm seeing my students in their in their homes i'm seeing their kits i'm going man your hi-hats over in left field let's tighten that up right you know let's hey you know as hard as it's trying to tune drums over you know this kind of a thing you know we've get, tried right. it you're i can go man your, that setup. rack tom sounds like a timbale let's like clean that thing up you yeah, know yeah, for sure at least we can get them in the ballpark and it's cool, and I think it's cool for the kids too, because you know I'm always teaching at the studio. They're they're seeing me on my on my kit, right. um, which is a cool thing. And uh, they're like, "Oh, what's that? What's that?" You know, drummers, we all like gear. Yeah, you know, you know, everyone's like, "What is that symbol?" Or "What is this thing?" And it, it's cool. And I think that too is part of the learning process. Yeah, for sure. You know, um, well, that's drumming and teaching. What do you think about like concerts and live events in general? Like, like, what do you see? What do you see that do you have any timeline that you kind of intuitively feel like, okay, well, this is about when, you know, I, you know, I would love to see us back at it this fall. Yeah. I, I would, I mean, I've got some, you know, I've got things, big things booked that, you know, I really would hate to see slip away. Yeah. Like a European tour. Aren't you going to do like a, a month in Europe? Yeah. But, and you know, but if it's not safe, it's not safe. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's not worth it going out there and getting sick. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. it's not It's all and, fun and games until you die. And you know, the question is, is like once they do open back up, I mean, how comfortable are people going to be feel going out? Like, Oh, yeah. you can go to the, you can go to the club and see a band. Sure. Yeah. If they told you to tomorrow, you could go, it, it was legal for you to go see a band. I mean, would you go out to the club tomorrow night? I mean, I don't know. Um, that's I don't a good know question. either. I, I don't know how to answer. I that. don't know that I would right now. I I I, I kind of feel like there's an intuitive sense people have of like, okay, this is like how much time we need to give this, you know. And um, obviously that, you know, sometimes intuition can be wrong, but I I you know I feel like back and forth, 
basing your sort of thinking off of the current, you know, CDC, WHO, government guidelines, you're, there's sort of like a, like a, you know, it's a conversation. It's a conversation that's happening, you know, between society and between government about, you know, how much risk are you willing to take? And, yeah. you know, music and live events, I think, are one really, they're a real bellwether, I think, of how, um, or, you know, or a barometer, I guess, uh, of how we're how comfortable we are going back to normal because that's the that's like the most social thing you can do is go out to a show and just surround yourself with a bunch of people that are sweating you know in in a yeah. in a concert hall or you know assuming it's a stand up show and it's not like a sit down theater show but you know right. I mean so I think you know in a sense it is it is important to gauge you know musicians and people and music lovers because that's you know a lot of stuff you can do without having to necessarily like be right up next to people but you know going to festivals going to concerts going to you know live events is not right. not one of them you know that's irreplaceable so, i mean and i would say i would say too i think it's important you know there's a lot of people out there doing live streams yep. daily yep. you know uh big bands to small bands you know and I think if you are a true lover of music and a supporter of the arts you should you know help these people out buy their records buy their merch throw a couple you know bucks in their in their tip jar or whatever and and help them along because it it is hard it's hard for everybody yeah. and um you know it's hard to stay kind of positive too um yeah well speaking we of don't know where the end is you know speaking of donations uh we have a paypal set up for beat broadcast this is something we're doing you know for the love of the community to entertain to educate but we certainly don't not love money uh, for what we do <laughs> so if you want to <laughs> donate a little bit to uh, to help us cover the cost of producing a show like this uh you know jesse is full-time teaching and gigging uh you know i i have a day job but i'm you know i'm pretty active uh, nights and weekends as a as a dj and producer myself and i've lost you know some some considerable income from this myself so uh any any and all uh, contributions to our to our show here are warmly appreciated so uh, yes. please hit us up paypal.me slash beat broadcast um and yeah uh, yeah and oh uh heads up we're live also on youtube finally uh we got the restream going on so we're live on two platforms um happy yes. to see that that is actually working um and yeah so uh, check and us out last on week's and episode, sorry, I was going to say, and last week's ec episode is up there on YouTube if anybody wants to catch that. That's right. That's right. So, so well, what do you yeah. think? Should we get into some drums here, buddy? Yeah, man. Moving on to moving on to lesson of the week here. Um, All right. So uh, I thought th uh, this week what we talk about is uh, some paradiddle uh, fills and some paradiddle variations. And right. uh, we'll, we'll go into that. This is kind of a, we'll see here. This is kind of a two level a lesson here. Okay. I'll try and be quick. Yeah. Um, so uh, for those of us who don't know, in case we don't know, paradiddle is right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left. Okay, that's our paradiddle basic rudiment. Every drummer should have this under their belts, locked right. down. You're right, going right. to play it forever. Yeah. Um, so the concept here is um, it's pretty simple. We're going to try and make a paradiddle fill. Okay, and this is where we're going to start with this lesson. So uh, let's say we're going to play these paradiddles in a 16th note phrase. Okay, so that's four groups of paradiddle. Right, left, right, right. Left, right, left, left. Right, left, right, right. Left, right, left, left. 16 stroke. Yeah. Hey, your, uh, your audio just cut out, Jesse. Hey, Jesse, your audio just cut out, buddy. Hey. Some of the this is some of the okay. Uh, my back. Yeah, you're back. Uh, Hopefully, I fixed the it. Hazards of of Zoom. What's uh what's going on with that? Do you think? How's it, how's that? I get that, That's, buddy. Yeah, yeah, you're back. All right, you're back in it. Okay, good. Sorry, um, it was dipped out for a second. So paradiddle fill. Now, what I want you guys to think about here is we can voice this paradiddle a lot of different ways. We can play it as a groove. We can play it as a fill. Um, it's really cool. Uh, one thing I would like everyone to start thinking about is, you know, we can break this paradiddle up. So, for right. instance, I could play out of a groove. Maybe. Now, that's pretty even, right to left. Right, right. So what I would like to do here is I would like to play 
we're going to try and give the right side of this paradiddle just a little more muscle. We're going to think, let's think of it as an accent. Okay. okay. So we're going to accent all those right sticks. So that'll sound like this. And you can kind of ghost note the, the left stick and it really gives it a cool feel. You Now, I can put that into time. Or I could also flip it and play it. Yeah. Okay, Very so cool. all I'm doing is basically elevating one side or the other. Now we're going to talk a little more about this concept next week. Uh, we're going to dive into some stuff. Uh, both John Henry and I are both kind of Jojo Mayer fans. So we're going to talk about a couple of his philosophies. Oh, yeah. And so I'm just going to leave that right there. But the 2.0 of this lesson, and I want to get to this here is now we're going to expand this. So we've played a single paradiddle. And what I'm doing here is I'm playing the accents on those downbeats, or I should say the top of each, section right right left right left right left right right left right, left okay yeah so now let's move on let's go to the double paradiddle okay okay double paradiddle right left right left right right left right left right left left now look i'll put all this in the comments when we get a chance maybe after the thing you can sw swing back by so here we go sure. double paradiddle Okay, and I'm accenting the tops of each of those paradiddles. Or I should say the right, right, and then the left, left, okay, on that side of it. Yeah. So the snare sounds dope, by the way. I love it. Thank you. The snare drum? Yeah, was that the, which one is that? This is the Baltimore uh, Baltimore Drum Company. Nice. 13-inch uh, yeah. snare. Yeah, I've always okay, loved that so sound. I love this drum. Um, okay, and then finally, the triple paradiddle, okay? Right, left, right, left, right, left, right, right. Left, right, left, right, left, right, left, left. So, okay. Okay. So, I'm, I notice I'm, t I'm accenting the tops of those one and two and three and diddle. Great way to count pair diddles. One and diddle, one and diddle, one and two and diddle, one and two and diddle, one, two, three diddle. I can go yeah, right yeah, through yeah. them, cycle, cycle right through those. Yeah. It's a little more musical to count it that way. For me, I'm not going right, left, right, left, right, left, right. I get lost in there. Okay. Yeah, right. So it just yeah, it, you, you gotta, get lost. You gotta, now you gotta. You gotta now I, I should say I should give a shout out where shouts do. Uh, I learned this exercise from a really great uh, drummer named Ronnie Shaw. Okay? okay. And if you guys are in anywhere near the D.C. area, you need to look this cat up because he is the real deal. He's a really killer player, a excellent human being, and a fantastic teacher. Nice, fantastic teacher nice. okay ronnie shaw so anyway so ronnie showed me this so the idea here is what we're going to do is we're going to take a string of numbers again i'll put this in the comments of the the uh exercise so let's just take a real simple one to start we're going to say one two three three two one that's real simple okay i'm going to play Right, left, right, right, left, right, left, right, left, left, right, left, right, and go through right, right through. So watch here we go. One. I'll just do one, two, three first. Make this easy. One, one, two, one, two, three. Okay. Yeah. See what I did there? One, one, two, one, two, three. Okay, and I stopped it. Yeah. Now I would say this fill helped me out. I mean, how many times have we been in a fill? We come around something and our sticking gets turned around. Yeah, right, and right. Don't want to get out of it. Yeah. I'm like, Whoa, this was a great fill. I did something really cool, and then it's like, blah. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. So I think we've all been on that train. This right? helped me kind of ease up those transitions. Yeah. It helped me one come out of a fill on a double somewhere that I wasn't really comfortable with. Right. So I could turn it back around to the downbeat. Right, because you got to go around the kit, and then you're coming back. And if you end on the right hand, then you got to come back to the one on the hi hat. And sometimes, right. like ergonomically, spatially, that just doesn't work. So you got to do that double on on the end. Exactly of it so to turn it around. Your, physically, so, you know, it's about getting your hand back there. 
Right. So what I did with what this is something I worked out with Ronnie and I'm going to show this. I'm going to share this in the uh, comments, like I said. So we would do streams of 12 numbers, random numbers, one through three. OK, so I have a I have a some numbers scribbled on a piece of paper here. It looks like one, two, three. I don't, I don't uh, expect anyone to memorize this. Right, right. One, two, three, two, one, two, three, one, two, 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 one. OK, just random numbers. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to play off the snare drum. Wow. And I just cycled right through those. I'm just doing one half of each of the paradiddles. Right. Now, let's talk about voicing that because, uh, you know, as cool as that is, how am I going to use that thing, right? Right. So what I like to do is I like to instead of playing as an accented stroke in my snare drum i'm going to put that in my rack toms yeah so here's what the drill sounds like and i often like to double those accents with my kick okay yeah yeah there now that's starting to sound like something yeah, yeah. still a little long-winded so how are we going to apply this yeah all right so now I have a feeling you're going to tell us I'm going to tell you. <laughs> All right, buddy. All right, so so let's take a let's take a simple phrase, okay? And hopefully this makes sense to people. If 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 you have questions, please comment. I'll I'll try and answer them best I can. Yeah. We're going to do a 16th note fill. Okay? Let's we'll kind of keep it simple. 16th note fill. So that means we have 16 strokes within the fill. Okay? Gotcha. So, an easy way to set up 16 strokes would be four single paradiddles. Right, for one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a pair. Right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left, and so forth. Okay, mm -hmm. that's an easy one. So that's and I play that already, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. Single paradiddle fill, real cool, and you can voice it like that, and it gives you this really cool thing. Now, let's shake it up. How about we do two groups of triple paradiddles? Okay, so each, each half set of the triple paradiddle is eight strokes. Okay, so two eight stroke patterns that 16, right? So gotcha. that fill is going to be. I uh, see if I mess it up. We'll do it again. There you go. The hip. Yeah. Right. So now there's a bunch of variations there. Yeah. Let's go one step further. We'll start to really get weird. This one, we're going to do a single paradiddle followed by two sets of double paradiddles. So you have a group of four followed by a group of six followed by another group of six. That's 16, right? On paper, that, that fill looks like one, two, two, okay? Yeah, I like that. Now, here's the cheat. This goes back to, on that final right hand paradiddle, I'm having to play right, left, right, left, right, right. And then I gotta play a downbeat. Right. So that's three rights in a row. I can, we can do it, right? Yeah. But the cheat I often play on that is I'll just play a set of singles. Yeah. So, but right. just usually only on the very last set right. will I play the single. Right. Okay. The rest of the time so I'm playing you got the, an easier motion to get to that ride crash or whatever you're hitting. Yeah, because having a like, da boom is yeah. Yeah. a quick double and then into the rat into the symbol or whatever. Yeah, it is. doesn't come those kind of things don't come entirely natural, but it's the kind of thing that's really good to learn to do when you're, you know, when you're physically kind of like can't get back to the kit or can't back get back to wherever you were gonna, you know, hit the one on. Right. Now, what I would say is, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to wrap this up here shortly. So everything I'm playing here, I'm playing. Right. I'm putting that accent up in the rack, Tom. But I, I would challenge everybody when you're practicing this, revoice it. OK. And I like to play it. If I'm pushing these accents here, I'm thinking those push. I like to think push pull a lot when I'm playing the drums. Gotcha. If I'm pushing those accents. OK. What if I pulled those accents and I set the whole thing up like this? Now I'm yeah. playing kind of my home base is out in the rack is in the toms and I'm putting my accent in the snare drum. Yeah, and you man. can 
on it, and it's super fun. Dope. So, I love it. In the comments, I'm going to put a rack of uh, uh, some strings of just some numbers, 12 numbers in a row that you can get the, the thing going on. Yeah. Then I'm going to give you some 16th note combinations, and then I'm actually going to give you some six tuplet combinations that I put together. A little bit harder, I recommend get those 16th notes solid yeah. before you're tapping the six tuplets. Yeah, yeah. But the cool yeah. thing is, you know, you could even slow it down. You could play this over triplets. So, you know, how does a triplet, you know, I could play two twos or a three and a one. However, I, that, you know, a tri set of triplets would be 12 strokes. So figure your math out, keep everything their corresponding value, start putting it together in a puzzle. Right kind on. of an interesting way to think about it when we spent so much time reading notation and doing all this stuff. And all of a sudden now you're going, well, I'm just just random numbers here you know yeah yeah it was a cool approach and, and um uh, again i want to thank ronnie shaw for showing me that one which was yeah super. well check out everybody check out the comments look for some uh, maybe some notation pdfs or something that you're gonna post in there or um and check out ronnie shaw so there's yeah. there's paradiddly fills and some variations <laughs> on it um and uh up next on this episode, we wanted to, you know, we like to like really, um, you know, honor musical heroes and inspiration. So I think, you know, a regular part of this show is just going to be, you know, birthdays and, and, and memorials, you know, and um, uh, another recent passing in the music world, although he wasn't a drummer per se, uh, he was very influential, I think, on a lot of, um, a lot of, you know, producers who, you know, came after him and uh, was a founding member member of a, a really um, a really important group called Kraftwerk, um, and that is uh, Florian Schneider. Uh, so he was one of the co-founders uh, with uh, of Kraftwerk in I think 1969 or 70 around thereabouts. Um, he started Kraftwerk with uh, Ralph Hutter, and yeah, in 1970. Um, so he passed away, I believe, on the 21st, and. Um, I I have had the great privilege of seeing Kraftwerk I think twice now. Once was at the 9:30 Club in DC, uh, and then the second time was I think Moog Fest 2014. I believe that was when they were at, in Asheville, and that was one of the most mind-blowing shows I've ever seen. Uh, they um, well, first of all, let me give a little bit background on Kraftwerk. They, you know, they came out um, with, th they were real experimentalists in electronic music. And actually, um, I, s I remember seeing some footage from the 70s of them playing these kind of like handmade sort of uh, piezoelectric drum pads. Uh, so they were, you know, they were kind of very into electronic percussion uh, from, a, from a pretty early age or from a pretty early point in the, in in the uh, development of those instruments um you know you 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 had electronic drum machines that were sort of incorporated into church organs and i think you know roland um w sort of uh was one of the first you know drum machine makers so you had you know real early proto drum machines back then but you didn't really have like drum pads and i've, I've actually got this guy here the uh the roland octopad it's the sbd30 and that's that's something i've used or a variant of it going on 20 years now. I, I've been into electronic percussion for a long time. And so um, it was really kind of amazing to me to see that, I, I, I guess I just thought that the, all this stuff was sort of invented in the 80s, you know, and it kind of came around with the, you know, the sort of uh, electro, uh, electro pop and electro funk kind of movement of the, of the 80s. But a lot of this stuff had its roots in, in the kind of, um, you know, the German kind of kraut rock scene and, Kraftwerk kind of went off on their own direction, though, and they re they really uh, created this. Initially, it was really sort of a pretty experimental, all instrumental um, kind of music. And I've been re-listening to their catalog this week, um, and I'm just really struck by how much of this stuff was actually kind of like ambient music and just very experimental. Um, uh, Florian Schneider also he, he played the flute and the violin um, and some other stuff, but he was also a real um, like sound engineer and eventually uh you know Kraftwerk went on to they kind of founded you know they they recorded um their their first few albums at a at a studio in Cologne and but then they went on to just kind of make their own studio called I think it's called Kling Klang Studio and that became kind of the basis for a lot of the sounds that they got into in the late 70s and 80s that kind of electro pop sound 
you may have heard one of their songs, you know, Autobahn, um, you know, Computer World, uh, Radioactivity. There's, you know, look them up. There's, there's a lot of really amazing tracks. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very particular sound. It's not like, I don't know if everybody, you know, is going to love it, but it has a very specific kind of, you know, kind of precise German electro pop feel, at least their, you know, their sort of later stuff that really came, went on to influence like hip hop and, you know, like Africa Bambata sampled them. So a, a lot of their, a lot of like, it, and they were really hugely influential in the sort of the foundation of techno, you know, Juan Atkins, Derek May, um, those guys in Detroit re were really sort of influenced by Kraftwerk as well. A lot of, a lot of the eighties electronic, you know, musicians really, really dug their stuff. Um, so yeah, R.I.P. Florian Schneider. Um, anyway, getting back to these shows, I saw them play a show in 2014 at Moog Fest in Asheville, North Carolina, and they had this 3D setup with like 3D 3D projectors, and they gave everybody uh, a set of 3D glasses. And the whole like, I mean, it was I think probably the most elaborate like audiovisual set up for a show that I've ever seen. And 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 these guys, you know, they they always dressed in suits. They had this very like kind of Teutonic clean aesthetic with, you know, these guys in suits and they would just stand, you know, eventually originally they started touring with all they toured with all this heavy gear from the 70s and they basically took their whole studio and took it on tour, but then as software instruments and computers started to come around, they they basically just moved to just doing everything off of computers. So the two times I saw them, they're all just standing at these podiums with like a laptop right in front of them, just like like I am right now, right? Just like, just standing there, like stock still, like not moving, not dancing, you know? And it's, it's so it's a real particular vibe and aesthetic and it's not everybody's cup of tea, but like, it was just so cool. Like they're so committed to their vision, you know, and their sound. And, and so eventually they started doing everything with like just laptops and computers on stage. And so that's what they were doing in this 2014 show. And it was such a mind, blowing visual thing because you're not you're used to maybe like 3d movies i think avatar you know we saw that came out in 2009 and maybe that was an inspiration for them actually because that's when they first started experimenting with the with the 3d sort of live show but it was it was so surreal to see a live show with 3d visuals like that like it's not i don't think i'd ever seen anything before maybe in since too i don't think i've seen anything since then and so shout out to moog for having the kind of like you know like programming audacity to bring a show like because it must have been massively expensive and i think that was the last year they did moog fest in Asheville, probably because they completely blew their budget on big <laughs> like uh big shows like that i think that was also the year that like niall rogers was there and he did a show with like Sh with with chic and man what a that was such an epic year for moog fest anyway so that's my long-winded tribute to florian schneider and craft work um but um what I did want to do was kind of, as a tribute, I've got my DJ set up here going, you may have noticed this week. So I'm going to do a little like live craft work remix of their track called Computer World. So uh, yeah, give me just a sec here. I'm going to switch to switch to studio cam or to the top view here, see if this will work. All right, there we go. Okay. Okay, so this is a live remix of Computer World by Kraftwerk and myself. Thank you. 
Yes. <laughs> that John track. Henry Dale, y'all. There we go. That's nice. That's cool. Thank you. Thank you. That uh, that was all sort of free form improvised. So, um, yeah, that's um, you know, and I th- I think Kraftwerk would have loved a kind of setup like this where you can do live remixing. Um, although um, one thing I, I think Florian Schneider actually did leave the band in 2008. So uh, just a little bit of a, a trivia there. Um, but they kept touring, and I think they may still be touring. So if you get a chance. Uh, let me turn off this delay on my voice. <laughs> if you get a chance, definitely go see them. They, it is well worth it. So, um, also, we got a birthday, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, you want to take the birthday? We do. We, we do have a birthday. It was Dennis uh, Chambers. Dennis birthday. Chambers. Who, so. if you guys don't know who Dennis Chambers is, he's probably just about one of the baddest dudes out there. Played with P Funk. Played with a bunch of bands. Um, Schofield, he's the drummer on that on um, Pick Hits. Okay, killer, killer record. I, I actually, I've seen Dennis Chambers a couple of times. One of the coolest concerts I think I've ever been to in my life was I went to uh, to the Paul Reed Smith anniversary concert in Baltimore. Okay, and it was a Paul Reed Smith band with Dennis Chambers on drums and John McLaughlin on guitar. Holy shit. And it was crazy. For those of you who don't know, Paul Reed Smith is the, I believe the inventor of the PRS guitar, right? Yes, exactly. And that's, that's, you know, Santana plays it and John McLaughlin plays them. And, Does he? I didn't uh, realize. I didn't realize he was And then it was an incredible concert and Aquarium Rescue Unit was there. Okay. And um, that, they uh, kind of Colonel, what's his name? What's Colonel it? Bruce. Yeah, yeah, that was right before he passed. And Jimmy Herring was there. Jimmy oh. Herring also is playing Paul Reed Smith guitars, or at least he was. Right. And Jimmy Herring and John McLaughlin, they did all this Mahavishnu stuff, and it was like incredible. And Dennis Chambers was the drummer on it. I mean, did, that, talk did, about a dream gig. Yeah, that's insane. Did he ever play with Mahavishnu Orchestra? No, that was Cobham. Yeah, so it's been Cobham. It was Cobham. I mean, but Cobham left to do his own thing yeah, I, eventually, I who, right? And then it was like, I know like Narada, Michael Walden, yeah, who was a producer for Mahavishnu, ended up playing on some stuff with them. But I don't think yeah. any of their stuff really hit with the energy that Billy Cobham had. I, I always kind of wondered if, if that was, I'm, I'm sure he's jammed with some of the players in it, but I always wondered if, 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 if Chambers got into any of the Mahavishnu. I'm sure he listened to Billy Cobham. I mean, come on. Didn't uh, we go to a drum clinic he did together? I mean, is that right? Dennis uh, in, Chambers. Yeah. Didn't we go to that in Reston? Were you at that? With me? Yes. Where I don't that? remember where we were. It was in Reston. Yeah, some music that, store that, somewhere down there. What's that drum place there? There's some drum in Reston, Melody? Virginia. Is that what it's called? Maybe. Melody? Uh, yeah. yeah, really cool. They had a cool theater. Yes. Yeah. I remember I asked him a question after the after the drum it's clinic because he's like, you know, he's such a, like, if you haven't seen him, the guy's just like, He's just like a monster drummer. He's always doing these like just insane fills. And it's just, he's such a kind of like physically, you know, dominating player. Like, he, yeah. you know, but he does it with this sort of laid back yeah, kind like of like bowing like bubbles, bowing bubbles like with bubble gum. He's off just like, yeah, he's like, no big deal, whatever. And I think I asked him, I was like, do you ever like just get the urge to just play like normal <laughs> like pop music and some just straight ahead stuff and he's like oh yeah yeah i do that all the time i play on records all the time so i guess yeah you know he's he's been i mean he's got incredible pocket man i mean yeah. he's an he's an incredible player so anyways he did just have a birthday which i thought was pretty cool yeah happy birthday dennis chambers um that's that's great another yeah another so lady. anyways we're getting here we're getting close to the end here we did have some comments and people chiming in i'm gonna say hello to everybody who's nice. chiming in we really appreciate that okay um, <laughs> it's, it's, who do we got? Any what advice got? for wives of drummers? <laughs> who, who put that up there? Your wife. So, <laughs> um, any advice for wives? So, of drummers? and my wife's watching too. So, yeah, you know, let us do I, what let is us, let you, us do whatever we want uh, with drums. Yeah, like always. That's <laughs> that's right. So uh, just, Shannon told me one time, if I every drums that I buy, I have to take her on a vacation. Uh, that's a good which, deal. That's a good which, deal. I don't know. That's like it's expensive, quick. You know. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. 
But well, hey, that'll some, keep we got your, some hearts. We got some hearts chiming up here. For that'll more, that'll keep your uh, that'll keep your drum budget down. I bet you know you got to yeah. do a. Yeah, that's right. I haven't bought any drums for a while. The ones I bought were junk. So, um, well, yeah, I guess they don't count. Here's here's a bit of a, uh, advice, uh, honey. I brought home the congas this morning. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope you don't hey, mind. I know I got two drum sets stashed up in the in the um, office upstairs. So I do have the mesh kit at home too, yeah. and I put the Roland noise eaters under that. So because we live in an apartment, so I don't want to like bug our neighbors. But um, so. Uh, I, you what, know, I what? think this could be a whole top pop topic for a show right here. Just musicians and, and you know, yeah. But what advice to, do we have know, for drummers wives? What's I mean, you, what? for drummers? Why? I mean, you know, if you can skip the load in and sound check, I just advise you go ahead and do that. Just show up for the show. Yeah. Cause, uh, you know, well, shout know, out to my wife, Patty, Patricia Engel for, uh, being my ride or die at, Pretty much every show I've done over the last uh, three or four years, she's always there supporting. So here's some advice. Keep doing what you're doing because uh, oftentimes it's like that's your only friend that's showing up. And that yeah. counts for a lot. You know, so shout out to uh, drummer wives who who come to our yes, shows definitely. and support us. Because Thank you. It's, Love it's, you. It's, Thank you. Yeah. And uh, it's yeah. really hard to get your friends out to shows. So, yeah. So we know all about that. But yeah, shout out to Patty. Love you, baby. And what else? Uh, Stevie Watt, Steve Watte said, when we do get out, it's going to be lit. I think he's right. I think you and That's I true. talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. When they do cut us all loose and we get out there on these gigs and we have a show, I think not only are the bands going to be really hopefully bringing it, yeah. you know, like we've got a lot of pent up energy. Yeah. I think the fans and, and everybody are going to be really yeah, there and, for and sure. I, hopefully you know maybe this will change the dynamic at concerts you know who knows yeah maybe yeah it won't be the you know i'm staring at my phone the whole time or whatever maybe it's like people will actually stand there and appreciate it. i mean i don't know how many times we've been when do you think the first mosh pit is gonna happen <laughs> <laughs> have you yeah, been in, right. when was the last time you were in a mosh pit jeez i don't i couldn't tell you man i think the last time i was like actively in a mosh pit was like it had to be in the nineties. It was like probably some, the nineties. Probably like some Fugazi show. And even I, then, I don't have my, I don't have my Doc Martens anymore. Yeah. So. Even then, they were like, "Don't fucking mosh at our shows." <laughs> <laughs> like, like, don't be idiots. So yeah, don't be dumb. So. Yeah. Um. So yeah. Um. What else we got? Oh, you were gonna do a little kind of craft work inspired. Yeah, band. sure. So and that and I can take it out, that. right? Oh, that's about it. Everybody else is. I mean, people are just saying, "Hey, what's up?" Got some cool drummers laying here. Nice. Uh, I think people are digging what we're doing, and we do appreciate uh, everybody, uh, you know, chiming in and hanging out with us. And Absolutely. we're going to be back here next week, Tuesday night. Yep. Um. Yeah, Billy Same. Gunn said earplugs. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Got mine in right here. Yep. And, uh, you know, you only get one pair of ears, folks. I yep. tell my students that all the time. Yeah. You know, lay back, put that ear protection on. Absolutely, man. I, I wish, you know, I had learned that earlier on in my teen years when I was going to, you know, every show that I could. And Heck yeah. Was, and, you know, and when I was younger, I was in. working construction and doing all the stuff. I was around a lot of tools and, yeah, you know, that stuff took, I wish I had, I wish I had covered up a little more then. Yep. You know, I think, I yep. think some of that hearing loss came from, from that end of things. So, yeah, you know, absolutely. maybe at your day job, think about it on your day job, yeah. you know, you only get one set and when they're gone, they're gone. Yeah, man and uh yeah so anyways we appreciate everybody hanging out with us tonight i think we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up here real shortly um i'm gonna play a little jam yeah so and, jesse's uh, got like a sort of craft work inspired jam he was playing some stuff for me earlier sounds dope uh yeah so kick it
Hell yeah. That was dope, All dude. Right. I love Good it. Times. I love it. That's about the most electronic thing I think I've heard you play. <laughs> yeah, thanks. That's cool, man. That's cool. Yeah, it's fun. I like you the know, direction think, you're heading. <laughs> you know, got a lot of time in quarantine, man. Got to got to keep it going up, right? Yeah, right on. That was that was beautiful. All right. Thank you. Well, uh yeah. Everybody, thank you again for joining us. Uh, please hit us up in the comments, uh, like the Facebook page, and now we're up on YouTube too, so please uh, subscribe to our um, YouTube page. We don't have a custom URL for that yet, so I can't be like YouTube.com. I think you have to hit a certain subscriber level or something to get to that point, but just look us up, The Beat Broadcast on YouTube. You should be able to find us, um, and we'll, we'll post links in the, uh, in the comments on Facebook as well. Uh, and if you're so inclined and able, please uh, hit us up on PayPal if you, you know, feel like uh, what you're seeing is worth a little bit of your, your hard-earned money. Uh, we're certainly putting our time and effort into it and would appreciate any and all uh, any support that you feel like giving. So, um, yeah, that's, that's about it for this week. Uh, that's a Beat Broadcast Episode 2. And tune in next week, uh, Tuesday, 7 p.m., for episode number three. Oh, well, we're going to go over some uh, JoJo Mayer stuff, right? Yeah. Speaking we of are. Uh, speaking of drummers who love electronic Hopefully. music. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it'll be great. Yeah. It'll be great. And I just want to say I put the uh, I put some of that notation in the comments of the event uh, for that paradiddle stuff I was working on. If you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to message the page or message me, and uh, we can work it out. So Right on. All right, I'm just going to set up the... Uh, little credits here and we are out thank you everybody and we will see you next week